Welcome to our Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for October 15th, 2023. We are in the book of Ruth. So uh, we're suggesting uh, much of the first chapter of Ruth, Ruth 1, 1 through 17. And uh, we would recommend if you want to take the time to get the end of the story of Ruth as well, because it leads into uh, next Sunday's uh, reading as well. Uh, obviously, a lot has happened in between uh, last Sunday's pericope and this Sunday's. Uh, last Sunday, we were in Deuteronomy on the cusp of entering the Promised Land, where Moses uh, reiterates the Ten Commandments and the great Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The people enter the promised land, uh, and then you get this period of the judges, which uh, starts out pretty promising, uh, but ends really badly. Uh, We're we're not touching on uh, judges, or we're not reading from judges this Sunday, but uh, it it would be helpful, uh, we think, uh, for you to just say a little bit about that story, and especially how the book of Judges really ends in chaos, uh, this this people who have been given this covenant, who have been given these uh, Ten Commandments to learn how to live as free people, uh, they've really descended into chaos. And then, we, and uh, as the book of Judges says at the very end, uh, there was no king in Israel. In those days, all the people did what was right in their own eyes. So, uh, and it and it's not good. Uh, it's it's uh, gang rape and dismemberment of a woman and basically civil war. And then we get this lovely story of Ruth, which is set in the time of the judges, right? In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab. So uh, that's the the transition here. Uh, We wanted to say uh, just a word for those of you who are interested in kind of subdividing the narrative lectionary into uh, 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 shorter uh, themes or a a series on a particular theme. We uh, had talked uh, earlier in the year about using the theme of names up through October 1st, Uh, starting uh, probably last week, really, though we didn't talk about it, but starting last week, you could talk about the theme of covenant because, of course, last uh, week we get uh, the Ten Commandments and the and Moses reiterating the covenant uh, with the second generation, right? Not with your uh, uh, ancestors did God make this covenant, but with you who are all of here, all of you here alive today. In root, and that really continues that that theme of covenant really continues through Christ the King Sunday, which is November twenty sixth. So let's talk about covenant uh, in the. Book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth herself is not an Israelite, as as we all know, she's a Moabite, uh, but she chooses to enter into this covenant between God and Israel. You know, you. Uh, she says to Naomi, her beloved mother-in-law, "Your God shall be my God, right? And where you dwell, I will dwell." Uh, and and Ruth, this Moabite, enters, uh, chooses to enter into. Uh, this covenant between God, uh, the God of Israel, and uh, and God's people. If you um, leaned in at all to that idea that the uh, appropriate way of understanding uh, the Ten Commandments is to understand it as worship of the Creator God, um, it's something that is lived out, and the way that you understand it or the way others would understand it is not be by being told but by seeing it lived out. And that was how we ended um, last week. Um, It's not just hearing, um, but it is hearing and obeying. And in in this story, what Ruth has seen, even in the midst of Naomi's grief, is she's seen someone who's living out, being a different kind of person than she's seen in, in, you know, among those folks that have, done what is right in their own eyes. And uh, I think that if she only saw the chaos and the anarchy, she would have just gone back home like her other (laughs) sister-in-laws did. But she saw something different, even in her mother-in-law's grief, that caused her to say, I want to follow your God. And Mm -hmm. that's the way we're to live. We're supposed to embody these rules that cause people to say, I want some of that. 
I think I think that's what we see here. Hmm. I, lo I love that. Um, what I love about chapter one, well, I love what I love about the whole book is it is uh, an extended parable on what Chesed is. Chesed yes. is often translated as steadfast love. Chesed is really the quality it takes to stay in a covenant. Mm -hmm. So under the theme of covenant, it takes Chesed, which is really kind of like um, fierce and uh, determined love to stay in a covenant. It takes that to stay mm -hmm. in a covenant of uh, marriage. It takes it to stay in a covenant of friendship. It takes it to, for, to stay in a covenant with God. And of course, God is the one who has ultimate chesed. We don't. That's why God is able to stay stick with us even when we don't stick with God. But what you see here is this is the foreigner, Ruth, has the chesed to stay with her mother-in-law after all the men have died. Um, one of the things I like to tell my students is, okay, I'm gonna wreck every uh, movie or book novel for you because what uh, what they do right away is they do something really bad. I think I maybe said this a few weeks ago on this podcast actually. So what do they do bad? Well, here, let's kill all their men and then have a famine. And so uh, <laughs> it's, it's like with Harry Potter, What is, what is, uh, uh, what does uh, the author do to Harry Potter? First of all, we're going to kill his parents, and now he has to live with an uncle and cousin and who's abusive. Sure. He has to live under stairs, you know? Yeah. So this awful thing has happened. Um, a woman and her two daughters, all of their husbands have died, and there's a famine. And Ruth, it says, clung to her. Um, that clinging to her and saying, Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. Ruth is a woman of ultimate chesed, and she shows that again and again in the story. Yeah, and, uh, and the interesting thing, so when I teach Ruth to my students, I often play the Tina Turner song, What's Love Got to Do With It? Just as a, a kind of humorous way of getting into it, right? What what does human love have to do with, like, what is this story doing in the Bible, right? Like, God doesn't appear in a burning bush or any other way, really. I mean, God doesn't speak uh, explicitly in the book of Ruth. So what does this kind of ordinary tale of human love, uh, human chesed, uh, have to do with God? And it, it seems to me that this tale really uh, I, I like I like calling it a parable. is a is a reflection of is a, is a reflection of the fact that most often we experience God's chesed through our relationships with one another. Right? That there's not many of us. At least I've never had a revelation in a burning bush. Right? Um, but God's chesed, God's loving kindness, God's God's covenant love, is shown through the community, uh, most often, at least for me, right? The, the community that supports one another and prays for one another uh, and is there for one another, uh, especially in hard times. So this is what I see in this story of the, you know, the, the, the two widows and a farmer that is otherwise rather ordinary. This, this extraordinary chesed of Ruth's is matched by the chesed of Boaz, yes. who is a you know, pillar of the community and who steps up to do more than, than the law requires of him. Ruth herself does more than the law requires of her. Uh, and through it, uh, this, this terrible tale of death and loss uh, becomes a story of harvest and new life and overflowing uh, chesed. And, you know, if I dare to jump into the New Testament where Jesus says uh, to the woman at the well, so this is uh, a Samaritan woman, right? Um, that's um, part of this uh, intermarrying and whatnot that's happening during this time. And uh, he says, the time is going to come when worship of God is in spirit and in truth. It's not going to be where. It's not going to be on the mountain. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. And so... I think that that lives into what does it mean to embody the commandments, not just recite them, yeah. not just say, yeah. this is the law, but to live in such a way that causes people to say, your community, you're not like everybody else. And eventually, 
to understand one's identity to say, well, the community that I'm a part of isn't just an ethnic group. It's actually the people of the creator God made known in Jesus. And that's the spirit and that's the truth that is being lived out here. So in some ways, this story where God isn't speaking and God isn't doing something that is so incredible, it's actually makes the words of Jesus true. It is possible for us in the flesh to live in such a way that God's glory is embodied in our lives. That's that's fantastic. Thank you for saying that. And, and that would be a great, perfect ending to the podcast. But I, I want to jump ahead to chapter four for just a second and Please do. Uh, ask Catherine to say, I've heard you eloquently speak about the verses that are, are optional, but I think I would urge people to include them in chapter four. Yeah, yeah, I would too. I, uh, so my favorite verse in this book, uh, which I, I just love the whole book, is uh, in uh, verse 17. So just to review a minute. So Naomi comes back, she's bitter, right? She, she says, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, call me Mara, which means bitter. And so our, our friend and uh, retired colleague, Diane Jacobson, says the story is not is, is about Ruth, but it's also about Naomi becoming Mara and then becoming Naomi again, right? Coming back to herself. Yeah. Uh, and, and that happens uh, when, uh, when Ruth just happens to go to the field of Boaz and Boaz shows chesed to her. But it also happens here at the end. Uh, Na- so Ruth and Boaz get married. Uh, Ruth bears a son named Obed. Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse, uh, which by which you know we assume she kind of uh, uh, nanny, you might say. But the rabbi said no. Uh, she actually became his nurse, uh, his wet nurse. Mm-hmm. That her you know o- old breasts became full of milk again, and and she nursed Obed. Uh, and I love that midrash. You know, I don't think that's necessarily what the text is saying, but I love that midrash because it it goes back to this theme of emptiness and fullness, right? And Naomi says, "I went away full; God brought me back empty." But then it's the beginning of the barley harvest, and there's overflowing, uh, you know, heaps of grain. So I love this uh, this image of emptiness and fullness. Naomi uh, becoming his wet nurse, and then here's my favorite verse: the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, "A son has been born to Naomi." They named him. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Oops, sorry. I'm sorry. That's not it. It's verse 15. The 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 women say, uh, "Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him." I just I love that verse. Right? Uh, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons. I mean, what a phenomenal thing to say in this very patriarchal culture, right? Your daughter-in-law, who, this Moabite, this foreigner, right. who left her own homeland, who left her family to come back, who showed such such chesed to you, she is more to you than seven sons. And, Ru- and Naomi then recognizes uh, the grace of God, the chesed of God, in the love of her daughter-in-law, Ruth. <laughs>